an understanding of pathophysiology of hyperglycemic emergencies is vital to successful management. And the pathophysiology of diabetic ketoacidosis is largely in the setting of two major players which are responsible for the pathogenesis of the condition that is insulin deficiency and excess of counter-regulatory hormones. Both these conditions are essential for development of diabetic ketoacidosis and individuals who have deficient pituitary hormones like growth hormone and cortisol have a slower rate and milder form of diabetic ketoacidosis despite similar levels of insulin deficiency in other individuals. So it's both these are very important. The first and the major hallmark of diabetic ketoacidosis is absolute or relative insulin deficiency which basically triggers the lipolysis pathway in which there is production of the free fatty acids which are then converted into ketones and this ketoacidosis is responsible for a number of presenting features of DK in the form of acidosis, rapid breathing, abdominal pain and fruity odor. The major impact of counter-regulatory hormone excess is along with insulin deficiency is on the gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis pathway wherein there is increased production of glucose. And this glucose because of the osmotic diuresis effect causes the loss of glucose, potassium, sodium and water. So hyperglycemia and osmotic diuresis is largely responsible for severe dehydration which is observed in the setting of DK along with loss of sodium and potassium. What's important to understand is that despite the loss of sodium and water because the counter regulatory hormones are in a large amount in diabetic ketoacidosis, shock is usually unlikely. The presence of shock in a child with diabetic ketoacidosis should always prompt to the possibility of an underlying infection or cerebral edema. The major impact of diabetic ketoacidosis as we have discussed is in the form of increased production of ketones causing ketoacidosis and urinary loss of water and electrolytes. So dehydration is a major presenting feature of diabetic ketoacidosis and usually the level of dehydration is approximately 7 to 10 percent. But because the condition of the child with DK is quite sick, they have acidotic breathing, so tongue becomes dry, there is a tendency of overestimating dehydration. And this has adverse implications as giving excessive fluids is a major risk factor for development of cerebral edema. So as a rule of thumb, one should always assume dehydration to be one step lower when what we are assessing clinically. It's also important to look at other surrogate markers of hydration like hematocrit levels, uric acid, urea and proteins to really have a feel as to the level of dehydration that is there in a child with diabetic ketoacidosis. The other major impact is the sodium loss which is to the tune of 6 to 10 millimoles per kg. But because of the osmotic drag caused by hyperglycemia in which the free water comes out of the cells, the sodium levels are falsely decreased further. So the severity of hyponatremia is also overestimated and therefore it's absolutely important to calculate the corrected sodium which is basically based upon the principle for that for every 100 milligram per dl or 5.5 millimoles per liter rise of blood glucose, the sodium level comes down by 2 millimoles per liter and therefore corrected sodium gives the exact idea of sodium which is irrespective of the glycemic status. There is a significant potassium depletion which happens in the setting of diabetic ketoacidosis to the tune of 4 to 6 millimoles per kilogram. In fact, the whole extracellular amount of potassium may be lost but because of insulin deficiency and metabolic acidosis, there is a shift of potassium from the cells. So at presentation, the potassium levels may actually be normal or high in diabetic ketoacidosis and low potassium levels at diagnosis is a sign of severe potassium depletion and is an emergency which one needs to consider. So potassium deficit may actually be 
underestimated in the setting of diabetic ketoacidosis. And one way of correcting the effect of acidosis on potassium levels is the formula which tells us that for every 0.1 decrease in pH, there is a increase in potassium levels by 0.6. There is also a substantial loss of phosphorus, which is basically an intracellular ion to the tune of around 0.5 to 4 millimoles per kg in diabetic ketoacidosis. Although this hypophosphatemia may trigger development of lactic acidosis because of the shift of the oxygen dissociation curve towards the left hand side because of 2,3 DPG deficiency. There is not a significant role of routine supplementation of phosphorus because potassium phosphorus is not easily available in many settings. However, severe hypophosphatemia is associated with the development of rhabdomyolysis, which may be a dangerous condition. Typically happens when the phosphorus levels are less than 1 mg per dl and in those situations, correction of phosphorus is absolutely important. So now we understand the impact of DKA, but once we start treatment, there can be more problems because DKA is a complicated situation wherein treatment causes as much problem as compared to the actual condition. So what happens with treatment? The first step of treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis is basically hydration using sodium chloride. And this hydration causes decrease in the counter-regulatory hormones. This along with the expansion of the volume causes inhibition of the glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis pathway and decreases glucose levels by around 150 to 200 mg per dl even without addition of insulin. Once we start insulin, there would be further decrease in glucose but also the process of ketoacidosis and ketosis will decrease. And unless insulin is added, there will be no resolution of ketosis just by fluids. This addition is typically done 1 to 2 hours after the initial hydration. The problems, however, are if that we are giving too much fluid, there would be a rapid shift in terms of osmolarity, resulting in development of cerebral edema. Similarly, too much sodium chloride along with potassium chloride predisposes to development of hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. On the other hand, excessive amount of insulin use will cause shifting of potassium to the cells as well as potassium loss causing hypokalemia. So therefore, while treatment will result in significant improvement, one needs to be cautious in terms of not inducing complications like edema metabolic acidosis and hypokalemia. So in a nutshell, the major cause of concern while treating a child with diabetic ketoacidosis is the development of cerebral edema, hypokalemia and metabolic acidosis. Cerebral edema is usually indicator of a severe disease and occurs in the setting of giving too much fluids, soda bicarbonate resulting in osmotic shift. There is a high mortality and morbidity with cerebral edema and therefore, one needs to be cautious into the amount of fluid which is given. It should never be more than 1.5 to 2 times maintenance and slow correction. Use of mannitol is absolutely important. It's also important to emphasize out here is that cerebral edema while typically described between 6 hours to 24 hours of treatment can occur even at diagnosis if an individual has been treated with fluids in a different medical setup. So one needs to have a high index of suspicion for development of cerebral edema in that setting. Hypokalemia typically happens with insulin therapy. So one needs to be cautious in individuals who have low potassium to begin with. So if the potassium levels are below 3.5, one needs to defer insulin therapy. Similarly, if hypokalemia develops during the treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis, it's better to decrease insulin and add potassium supplementation in this setting. Acidosis in diabetic ketoacidosis occurs because of ketosis, infection, and finally, if one is giving too much amount of sodium chloride and potassium chloride because of hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. However, acidosis is uh, hazardous only when it is very, very severe. 
and it improves rapidly with the correction of diabetic ketoacidosis. So therefore, alkali, which has so many side effects, should be avoided under all circumstances. Other complications of diabetic ketoacidosis include opportunistic infections like rhinocerebral mucormycosis, rhabdomyolysis, which typically presents in the setting of severe hypophosphatemia, presenting with muscle pain, colored urine, and development of renal failure, and thrombosis, which may be venous thrombosis like cortical venous thrombosis or peripheral thrombosis because of significant hyperosmolality. Cerebral edema is by far the most lethal complication of diabetic ketoacidosis and it is basically a state of adaptation. So essentially in the setting of hyperglycemia, the fluid comes out of the cells causing a shrinkage of cells. After some time to really counter these effects, these cells produce osmos which basically cause the cell to retain their shape. Sudden correction of hyperglycemia using insulin causes decrease in glucose and shift of the fluid to the brain along with giving too much fluid causes the development of cellular edema. So this is basically the osmotic model but now it is considered the cellular edema may actually occur not only because of osmotic factor but because of vasogenic effects which are inherent to the process of diabetic ketoacidosis. So one needs to be very cautious that both aspects would have an important role. Soda bicarbonate treatment is definitely one of the major risk factors and should be avoided at all costs. Cerebral edema should be suspected in the setting of severe disease given with insulin bolus, high amount of fluid infusion and soda bicarbonate level. So overall, when we talk about management of diabetic ketoacidosis, we are talking of a tight rope in terms of balance of giving fluids, which is not too less to avoid dehydration or too much to cause cerebral edema or metabolic acidosis. Similarly, giving not too little insulin so as to prolong recovery or to cause a rapid fall. But if you look at this balance, what it is clear that if we do a slow correction, we may have a longer recovery or dehydration may last for a long state, but we will definitely avoid the complications like cerebral edema or metabolic acidosis. So the mantra of management of diabetic ketoacidosis in this day and age is essentially to use slower correction of fluid with lower doses of insulin and that will avoid complications. Hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state is a condition which is quite similar to diabetic ketoacidosis and occurs in situation where there is sufficient amount of insulin so as to prevent ketosis. So under these circumstances, hyperglycemia is the major problem which basically causes loss of excessive amount of glucose and electrolytes along with water. And this osmotic diuresis causes severe dehydration along with hypokalemia and hyposodium levels may also be lost to a great extent. Because there is enough insulin, there is no significant development as far as ketosis is concerned. So these conditions are associated with mild ketosis as compared to diabetic ketoacidosis and presentation is usually with features of dehydration and hyperosmolality. Because the condition is often missed, there is severe dehydration and condition usually presents when the blood sugars are more than 600. There is mild, if at all, any ketosis and no acidosis and osmolality is very high. Hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state typically happens in individuals with uh, type 2 diabetes, so usually they are obese adolescents. Can, however, happen in obese type 1 individuals who are taking a lot of carbonated drinks, that is why they have high osmolality. HHS state is associated with greater dehydration as compared to diabetic ketoacidosis and unlike DK where one tends to overestimate dehydration because of the increased tonicity caused by high glucose level one tends to underestimate dehydration and we need to take one step over this is usually much higher than diabetic ketoacidosis. Sodium deficit is also quite significant in setting of HHS as is potassium deficit and one needs to be cautious about these deficits. Phosphorus deficits are higher compared to DKA and therefore there is an increased risk of developing rhabdomyolysis. 
So in a nutshell, hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar state is associated with more severe dehydration with minor ketosis and acidosis as compared to diabetic ketoacidosis.